Good afternoon. Uh, Governor Page, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to open things with a statement if you'd like. I, I'd rather wait for the Okay, thank you. I'd like to call then on uh, state representatives that are here today and offer them an opportunity to make a statement. Uh, first, Representative Peter Edgecombe. <coughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, especially meeting a young lady here who used to pick potatoes for my father on his uh, potato and livestock farm in Limestone a few years ago. Uh, but I am Kierbrook's state representative. I serve on the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee as the House Chair, and also I'm on the Education Committee. And at at this, uh, also, by the way, in the, in the 1980s, uh, I used to live in Frenchville, and I was a vocational director in the St. John Valley for all the vocational programs here. And my three children graduated from uh, Wisdom High School. But at this time, I'd like to just mention to you that there is uh, one part of what we're going to be talking about today, and that is there's been uh, suggestions in the state legislature that we share the, uh, the deficit or where we're going to make up uh, 100, 200 million dollars, that we share equally with all the departments. Well, education, in addition to health, edu uh, the HHS, education is the next largest part of the budget. Mm -hmm. And let you know that I will be opposed to making any effort to spread it with all the departments in the state because those are the that's where the money is. So if it doesn't come out of the HHS, it comes out of education. And I'll tell you why. Aristic County is a heavy receiver of funds uh, for, for education. Under the EPS formula, I can tell you that I had worked as a, an interim superintendent in Hodgson. I worked as an interim in Holton. I worked as a school superintendent in SA, or School Union 122, Woodland, New Sweden, Westmoreland. Uh, in Stockholm. And uh, those schools, and by the way, living in Caribou and Limestone is part of that RSU, every one of those schools are considered high receivers of state funds. All of those receive 75% or more of their budget from the state. And I would hazard a guess, because I'm not sure with the other schools, that many of them receive two-thirds or more of their budget for education it comes from the state. And yet there are towns, and I won't name any because the press is here, uh, I won't name uh, some of the towns that receive 5% of their budget. Now let's say that the Appropriations Committee decides, or we decide as legislators, to cut anywhere from 8 9% from everyone. Well, 8 or 9% from that 75%, as a matter of fact, Caribou and Limestone are closer to 80%, their budget comes, one of the highest receivers in the state, comes from the state of Maine. So we would share in that, and the high cost, where will the cost go? Local taxpayers, unless you want to cut teachers and cut programs, uh, that immediately shifts over to the, to the taxpayer. I won't take any of your more, any more of your time, Steve, uh, but uh, I just want to let you know why I would be opposed to uh, shifting it equally amongst all the departments. Thank you. Representative John Martin. Thank you all for coming, and uh, it's a great day to have all of you here and have the governor with us. Uh, let me just quickly give you a little bit of a, of a history. As you may know, I'm on the Appropriations Committee and heard about 250 people testify before us over a three-day period. And then individually, people who couldn't testify uh, gave us letters. And they were probably about six inches thick. And we made a commitment that we would, uh, in effect, read every one of them. And we did during, during that period. Uh, and obviously, reacting to the potential impact uh, of, of the governor's uh, proposed budget. Now, first of all, let me say uh, there is absolutely no desire by anyone on the Appropriations Committee to cut money from education. I want to make that clear, Representative Edgecombe. So that's not an issue. 
Uh, that's not where we're going. That's not where we intend to go. Let me just say that there are all kinds, whenever we get a budget, and this is not the first time that we've received a budget from a governor that some of us didn't like. I mean, so what's, what's new? I mean, basically that happens. Proposals are made by the governor uh, and the administration, and then they go to the Appropriations Committee. And obviously there's all kinds of reasons as to why perhaps, and I don't want to go necessarily into all those because I could today, but I need to tell you that we will end up with a balanced budget. The Constitution of the state is very clear that at the end of June we have to balance the budget, and we've always done that. There's only one state in the country that doesn't have to balance the budget, and that's Vermont. And of course, our, our fathers in Washington. Uh, and and they, they never, ever balance the budget. Uh, matter of fact, we're just fighting two wars while raising a tax for the first time in history. So you wonder why we have a deficit, but that's another story. So, so we, we, as, we, we look, as we look through what's happening with the proposals, uh, there are things that I know we can do, as a matter of fact, things that we've already started working on, uh, that I am convinced that we will be able to make adjustments uh, in the budget uh, and, and to provide uh, to some direction. Now, what are they? Keep in mind that we are starting work session uh, on Monday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, the day after the legal holiday for the first of the, the, first of the year. And that will be the beginning of the process, and we will go through it. Now, at some point, we will come to a point where maybe some of us will disagree. But keep in mind that the goal has always been, and it is this time as well, to balance the budget, one, within the available resources that we have, the money that we have, and then to make sure that we don't hurt people in the process. I want to use one example. The, many of you are here because uh, I suspect PNMI uh, that's a, I mean, that's a private non-medical institution service provided by the state. And how we got into that many, many years ago was when there was a tightening up on the, on the uh, requirements for nursing homes. And all of a sudden we went through Med 90, as it was called, and nursing home standards were raised. And then there were a lot of people who didn't meet those standards, and you, some of you who have relatives or been in nursing homes, you have to follow the ghoul uh, assessments in order for someone to be, uh, to be placed in a nursing home. So if you didn't meet those assessments, even though you were medically needy, couldn't take care of yourself, but you didn't meet all the standards, then you could not be in a nursing home. So we created, along with the federal government's agreement, this new program, which is known as the boarding home program. And, and that serves about 4,400 people in Maine, including many in Fort Kent, uh, Eagle Lake, Madawaska, et cetera, all over. And, and so part of what is in the governor's budget is to eliminate that in the second year, the $47 million, which you have on the sheets, have been passed out. I believe there are three states that use the same method that we did 10, 12 years ago. And, and so when I started looking last week as to what have other states done, basically, because what's happened to Maine is that the federal government has said, look, you can't be using federal dollars because you're saying they're not medical. So you need to find something else. So the two things that I suggested to the commissioner, for example, one is to go in to, to to the federal government uh, and request a waiver or at least a postponement of the implementation of the requirement that they're no longer going to pay that. Now we ran into trouble and they, in Portland with four uh, programs that they said they had to terminate and stop payment, which they did. The state stopped payment or else we wouldn't have gotten the federal money back. And two of those operated by Catholic Charities of Maine and they had, in order to keep operating, they had to lower the number of people in the institution to 14. And so, other states, what they've done is they've created another category of nursing home. They're not nursing homes per se, but they've created another category. And those are the, basically that would be the boarding home individuals who stay in a boarding home. 
and, and the federal government is participating with those states. So what we have to do in Maine is to basically work with CMS, which is the, our, our, the people who basically just make decisions as to whether or not they're going to pay or not pay. If the, the, they, they decide whether to grant a waiver or not grant a waiver. And, and I'm convinced, based on the people that I know in Washington, uh, that it is, it, it's a feasible alternative. And, and so I am less concerned than I was when I first saw the governor's budget. I was really concerned that on the first of the month, July, that everyone in boarding home in Maine would be on the steps looking for a place to live. That is not the case because I'm convinced that there is an alternate program. Excuse me, Governor. They've changed it now to July. No, in the budget. It's July 1 is when the money is effective. Uh, the cut, that's when it occurs. But So what we're hoping that, that we can do is make that change. And, and I'm convinced, and I'm sure the Governor would, be, you know, would agree that this is going to be an e it won't be def easy because we still have to match the money. Uh, but I think it's doable. I think the governor's point on the April, I think, is correct in terms of when we could run out of money for some of the programs. I, I don't disagree with that if we don't do something with the budget. I, I, I see where your April 1st date was, was coming from. But I was talking uh, specifically about the, uh, about the PNMI. Uh, so, come on in. Uh, so basically, I think that we've got some work to do, uh, and the Appropriations Committee, uh, I'm convinced we will do it, uh, and, and, and I think that, that these hearings have been very helpful in telling us what it is we shouldn't do so that we can make adjustments, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really pleased that you've come out to demonstrate your support for the existing programs that we have that serve serve Maine's elderly and disabled and other individuals in the state. Uh, and, and I think that my final word to you, and I've, I'll be here as long as you want to be here and answer questions as long as you want me to, but I, I think it's, it, we can do it, and when we're done, we will do it. And, and I think that having said that, there will be some people that won't be happy, uh, and, and that could well be. But we know that we have to do this, and that's why we have had the hearings. That is why we listened to all those people. That's why we met, and we will continue to meet, uh, and starting on Tuesday of, of next week, and we'll be in work sessions until we resolve it. So that's just my brief introduction, and then we can go to questions later. Thank you. Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Welcome, Governor. Uh, Cantario, born and raised in this area, actually Wallagrass, Route 11. I know a lot of you here. Um, I represent Madawaska, Frenchville, St. Agat, uh, District 2, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, really, uh, uh, surprised to see that we're in such a uh, situation as we are, but in many instances, the way I look at it is this here. Is we all have family here. All of us are affected by this here, and we need to take a real good look at it. Uh, I'm not one to make projections nor to say this is the way it's going to be, but I can tell you, like my father explained to me, you know where you're from, you know your people, and you need to go back there. And there's one thing that I want to tell you, is I don't want to disappoint any of you, because I think of all of you as my family. So I'd just like to say I won't go on. John explained things very well, and I would just like to say thank you for being here, and we'll take questions later. Senator Bernard Ayo. Thank you. First thing I would like to do is uh, thank the governor for coming up here. Uh, we did call him and he responded immediately. 
And uh, before I make any bold statements about what we're going to do or not do, I'm going to let the governor speak. I'm going to let uh, him uh, tell uh, uh, his plans. What I would like to do, however, is tell you that I know the governor. And I can guarantee you, I heard him speak a year ago in January, that he will not abandon anyone who is truly needy. What he, what the governor, I believe, and I will let him speak for himself, is trying to cut out the waste in this program and try to make it more effective so that people that are truly in need will will see the effects of the uh, the new budget. I'm positive that when this is over, it will be similar to the alarm that we had with the Aroostook Regional Transportation System. Everyone was alarmed. Everything worked out well because we did work at it. I, I can guarantee you this, this latest uh, alarm among the elderly people will be handled well. The people that are needy, truly needy, will be taken care of. I will guarantee you, including Representative Martin, Representative Edgecombe, Representative uh, Ken Terrio, will see to it that the people that are truly needed will, will be uh, taken care of. And the, the uh, amount of, of uh, money that is spent, uh, being wasted, will be uh, accounted for. And this is why we can put the money in where it's really needed. And I'm going to uh, defer to the uh, to the governor to uh, explain. Now, again, I thank him sincerely for coming up here. I know how long the trip is. I make it every weekend or every other week. And it's a long trip. And uh, uh, Representative Terry, Representative Martin does also. I want to, uh, again, thank all of you for coming. It shows your concern about this problem. But I think it will be taken care of in a very uh, good manner. Thank you. came to a surprise to him because I live in Mapleton and we've got one in Prescott Island and one in Holton later, but I figured I wanted to be here. I'm glad to see such a big room filled with people and I came here to listen, so I'm not going to go on and, and talk. I'm just going to hear it. came here to listen. Uh, we're all Aroostook County natives and uh, like Representative Ayat said, the governor won't, won't uh, no, no elderly people are going to be sleeping outside in the cold. The governor's not going to allow that to happen. Uh, we're going to have some sort of plan, and um, we're going to work through this just like we worked through a lot of problems. So thank you. Senator Troy Jackson wasn't able to be with us, but uh, he's asked that his son Chase be able to make some remarks on his behalf. Chase? Uh, again, my name is Chase Jackson, and my father is Senator Troy Jackson. He really, really wanted me to apologize that he couldn't be here himself. He left at 1.40 this morning for a woods camp at 30 Mile on the Pinkham Road, which is through uh, Portage, and he's running the dilemma all week. So uh, it wasn't possible for him to be here because he's one of the many Americans who are willing to stay in a woods camp during the week to uh, work here. I'm sure we have plenty of people here who have done that themselves. But uh, a few things he wanted me to impress upon you were that uh, he does not support the tenets of this budget. Uh, he doesn't support going after the most vulnerable citizens in our state in order to fulfill um, certain political ambitions and that uh, you have his commitment that he will uh, work for uh, the elderly population, not only in this district but across the state when he returns to Augusta in a few weeks and uh, also in the 126th legislature. So uh, I'd just like to again convey his apology that he couldn't be here himself today. But uh, I know that if he was here, he'd be very pleased to see how many turned out to speak and, and be part of this process because it's critically important that people get involved and uh, share their voices, share their concerns, and uh, get their points across. So thank you all for being here today. I'll be here till the end of the meeting, so if anybody has any message they'd like me to pass on to my father, please feel free to approach me and I'll get you in contact with him. Thank you. Those remarks and kind of setting the tone for uh, the, the monumental problem that uh, the governor in this legislature faces, which is a $220 million problem. And uh, it's something that we all have to be concerned about. Uh, we have to have a balanced budget, and something has to be done in order to balance this budget out. So that's a task that has to happen. Uh, the Agency on Aging does have the responsibility, as, uh, as our president uh, said earlier, to point out the consequences of, of public policy, and the budget document certainly is, a, is public policy. 
and um, there's um, the issues that we have as an agency. We looked at this. We looked at the people who are affected by this. Uh, causes us certainly some concern. Uh, <coughs> through meetings like this, uh, we hope to come to some kind of uh, resolution, not of the budget problem, but uh, the legislature is in the position of having to set some priorities, and the governor is in the position of having to set his priorities. And what we're going to see over the coming weeks is those things worked out as part of the political process. And uh, uh, what we wanted to do is to make sure that uh, our elected representatives that represent us all, and they do it pretty well uh, from Arusta County, uh, have the opportunity to hear from you folks about your concerns, and they'll carry that message uh, to Augusta with them. So we'll open it up now for uh, questions, comments from you folks that are here. It's your opportunity to talk with uh, your elected representatives. I know it's scary. <laughs> Nobody likes to speak in public. But you don't need to come to the microphone unless you really want to. <coughs> seen since I've been in Augusta. Now in February, I had 37 days from the day I was elected to put together a budget. And in February, we knew that we had this problem. And I tried. I tried to the point where the legislature had agreed to get a, a two-thirds vote. And I tried to remove childless adults because we knew that we couldn't finance everything with what we had. I tried and tried and tried, and I know I'm a Republican, but the only way we could get a budget is for the Democrats to say, no, we can't do it. They don't want to do it. They want to keep the childless adults. They want to keep 19 and 20 year olds on main care, and that's fine. I don't mind that if we can afford it. But this state, they're putting me in the position now of having to say, we're going to run out of money April 1st, and we have to make some tough decisions. And if I don't make the tough decision a month, so we knew we were spending six or seven million, I'm sorry, a week more than we were taking in. It turns out, after further escalation and eligibilities and utilization gone up, we are burning at a rate of 12 million. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's 12 million a month that we're burning right now, that we're spending that we don't have. Currently, we are spending the fourth quarter's money in the second quarter. So this isn't, believe me, I have no pride in stepping up here and, and looking at people that need a service, that I knew back in February they needed the service, and I went to the wall, I almost vetoed the budget over it because we were ignoring our, our responsibility to the main people. Now the PNMIs, we were told in 2003 to stop doing that. There's, there's communications back to 2003, that was not an acceptable practice. Of course we did it, we did it, we kept talking back and forth and they let us get away with it, let us get away with it. And finally, I think it was in October, November, they said, that's it, we're done. So I notified all the PNMIs and within 72 hours they changed their minds. They said, well, we'll go a little longer, but you got to get off this. So we have been violating federal rules without a waiver for all this period of time. We have the waiver for the childless adults. They gave it to us. I tried to implement it. And, and I got to keep them on because, I, quite frankly, one of the leaders was Representative Martin, very strong leader in DHHS. 
right now we're in a situation come april one i can close schools or i'm going to close nursing homes that's where i'm at as your governor i have no authority to make money i have only the authority to spend the money that's given appropriated by the appropriations committee there are nineteen thousand people childless adults who work who at the federal level are being those states doing it at like a hundred percent of poverty we are going up as high as two hundred percent of poverty and that's money coming out of your pockets out of your needs and it needs to be dealt with the letter that was written last friday anybody i'm up here basically because i read a letter that says the governor's budget is going to throw you out in the snow after christmas person that wrote that that board on a fire that person that is despicable it's cruel it's unnecessary and it's very stressful through a holiday season that should have never happened yes we have problems and yes there need to be things done but let me tell you this even if they fix it now the problem is structural we currently spend more than we bring in. We have been doing it for years. We spend more than we bring in. When you hear, we came in in, in January, January 5th, we had a $1 billion budget shortfall. And we tried, we, we got it cleaned up to about 200 and they say it's 221 million. I, I'm guessing it's a, even a little bit more than that. It's closer to 250 million. And what they've said is, we'll deal with it, we'll deal with it, we'll deal with it. Well, they kicked the can down the road. And we knew it back then. We could have fixed it then. And none of you would have been affected today. We wouldn't be having this meeting if we'd have fixed it once and for all in January. But we refused to. So now we have a real problem. Now it's going to affect more than just you. It's going to affect a lot. It's going to affect our schools. It's going to affect the bonding. And if anyone thinks that anybody, whether it's me, Representative Edgecombe, Ayotte, Terrio, likes to come up here and say, we are broke. That's not a big, we don't take a whole lot of pride in it. But I will tell you this, that every year we do this. We have the supplementals. Next year, this year it's about 120, next year it's a little over 100. It's going to continue because we're structured in such a way to bring in a certain amount of revenue, but we like to spend more. And we have been doing it year in and year out. And we band-aid it. We put band-aids on the can. And then we kick it again. And now the can has got a lot of holes in it. There's only two band-aids left. And one of them is schools. And the other one is you virtually send everybody home from April till June so you can get through the year. And so what? I ask you all here is I understand its problems. What I ask you is demand, demand that your representatives do your work and stop throwing around political rhetoric that's been going around for years. There's a lot of realities down there. And I'll tell you, I know when the checkbook is empty because the next check you send out the bank calls you and says you can't cash it so it's no different for government as it is for each and every one of you and with that I'll give you an example of fraud a lady goes to the doctor she, she gets on main care she's going through a divorce she got two kids Doctor talks to the lady. She decides, well, I'm going to have an operation so I can't have any more kids. 
So main care, will they do that? Yeah, main care does that. So we did the operation. Then she meets Mr. Wright six months later. She decides, well, I got the right one now. Maybe I want more kids. <laughs> so main care doesn't make that do that operation. So she raises the $6,000. The doctor decides that, that she has won't do that operation. He thinks it's immoral for what she's going through. So he says he won't do it. So she went out of state and had it done. She came back. She and Mr. Wright had another baby. And now there's five of them on main care. That's the type of stuff we deal with. Every Saturday morning, I have people come in and tell me some of the things that are going on. And now we're getting people looking into these things. I had one recently, he's an attorney. He said, you're going to hurt my business. I mean, what do you mean? I get paid to find ways to get people on main care. Those are the type of things we deal with. You ask, so we ask good, honest people like you, that if you suspect somebody taking care, taking advantage of the system, you call the state hotline, leave a name of that person, and we can take it from there. We can investigate. We're investigating several right now. In fact, last week, we just one was convicted out of uh, a town in Clinton for taking over $10,000 illegally. So it is happening. Is it happening a lot? Let's, I don't believe it's significant. I believe that 96%, maybe 97%, the money is spent in the right way. The problem with Maine is it's not that it's fraught with fraud as much as our rules and regulations are very easy. That's the problem. We need to toughen them up, make sure the money goes to the folks that need it. Yes, sir. There's 361,000 people in the system, we have figured out a way to protect 285,000. We're asking the legislature that we do not have the funds nor the legal status to continue with PNMIs because the federal government has said no more. So they have to fix that hole. I. It's the first I hear of it, but if it can be done that quick with the federal government, hallelujah. Governor, uh, when you went into office, okay, in your people in the Maine Heritage Policy Center uh, set up the budget. You must have suspected that at that point in time that there was going to be a problem. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. I tried okay. to tell. I tried to tell them. Okay, then. Listen, but, please. But what about listen, your people? Listen. Your people passed, they created the budget, you allowed the budget to go through. And in the same time, your people come up with a plan to, to benefit over $400 million in tax breaks to the upper percentage of the wage earners in, in this state. And one person in this room right here has benefited from that. Why can't you take and suspend that $400 million tax break and help every one of these people in this room. Okay. I think as the governor, you can do that. Okay. If I suspended my tax breaks, first of all, this is what we did. If I suspended the tax breaks, nobody would benefit because they don't take effect till later years. It's not this year and it's not next year. That's the problem. The tax breaks that we gave are for people making $19,950 and 70,000 people who pay, who make less than $19,000 will no longer pay income tax, which incidentally happens to be the majority of people who are retired. So that's a fact. The, the benefits are going in, the big benefits, the lower the 2% goes in, 2012. So in 2013, you, you're going to have a benefit. The, the other ones don't go to effect of 2014. 
So it's that you. It's what I said earlier about political rhetoric. People tell you all the stuff, but they don't tell you the facts. The fact is, we did not give money to the rich. Out of 600,000 uh, taxpayers, 513,000 will get a benefit. The rest of those are all millionaires if you can find them. I can't. Okay, the second part of my question is, that the budget was in, was in trouble from day one in, when your administration started. Okay, why didn't you forcefully stand up and go back to your people that created the budget and tell them to come back with a budget that that would take care of all the people of the state? Now, that okay. I'm going to put on to you. Is you Very good. Governor. Very, let me try to answer that. If you go to my budget, the original budget that I gave the legislature, they changed it. And I had taken out the childless adults. They put them back in. I took out the tobacco money and put the tobacco money into main care. They took it out and put it back in. And so at the very end, I had one or two choices. Sign it or don't sign it. If you don't sign it, they adjourn, they go home, then I have to call a special session. The one issue that was a problem was in mean care. And they did have one good argument, and the re good representative of mine keeps throwing it at us every day, is the system's not a good system. And he was right, because up until two weeks ago, it was not a certified system. We got the system certified by the federal government. So now that argument's out. Okay, the third, third question I have, okay, this is it to it, fraud within the system. How come in the past year that we have not heard in the news media about how your people have gone out and are, are now, and it's not public, that there's so much fraud in the system, then why aren't people being prosecuted and everybody can read about it in the news media? Other than all it is is just rhetoric from Augusta that says fraud, so much fraud, so much fraud. Why isn't the public being or being aware of the prosecution or the elimination of the fraud? Well, for one thing, it takes... Well, you know, if, if you've ever been to court, it takes several months to try a case. If you catch somebody, the one that was convicted last week was caught in February. We got there in January. So there was a lot of cases being done in the hundreds that are in the, the Attorney General's hands right now being investigated. So it takes a while. You've got to go the investigation route through the department, investigation route through the investigators, and then the attorney general gets it. They hire a lawyer, the attorney general represents the state, and it goes on and on for months. So you will be seeing a lot more than you have seen over the last eight years. Hiring special people, they're all on payroll today. Well, the attorney generals are already on board. <coughs> well, they're going to they're going to prosecute what they can at the time that they can. We're not going to hire more people. Let me illustrate the issue on on that point. Last year, the department had 2,000 cases on the hotline. 2,000 were dismissed outright because they were just complaints and there was no verification, no nothing with them. And, and of the 2,000, they, they go through the process of trying to get through the facts. Last year, we only had two cases that went to court. That's it. And, and so we met with the fraud unit uh, last week, the week before now, and basically told them if they needed a distant staff to let us know, because obviously they are not proceeding <coughs> Which I think they ought to be proceeding at the rate that they're proceeding. Well, well don't I, I don't know about that because if he's talking about this fiscal year or last fiscal year. No, the year we're in. Year we're in right now, sir. I met with the Attorney Generals yesterday afternoon and, and the people. There's a lot more than, there's almost 300 right now. The department told us they were two convicted last year. <coughs> okay.
I can tell you it takes a while to, to try them, and there's a lot more than uh, two that are going to end up being convicted for money they receive in 2011. Yes, sir. We prosecute some every year for the same thing. You have people, why is it that people come up from other states up here and get on subsidized housing in no time? And then another thing, we've been prosecuting them because we, we have another one and we couldn't do nothing because she's been living in a subsidized, she's been renting a subsidized rent for seven months. The, the landlord's been collecting the money for seven months. She never lived in the apartment. We have others that we catch, they're getting their pills, they're living in subsidized rents, they're selling their pills as much as they can get all the time. The other thing, they, they smoke three packs of cigarettes a day, they have a, a cell phone, they got a computer, and they got a TV. I understand that. But there should be some priority somewhere. You're absolutely right. One of the problems is in the state of Maine, our regulations are very low. And, and I will tell you, we've got some bills in, the emergency bills that we're trying to, to toughen them up. For instance, we have an income, an income test, but we don't have an asset test, <coughs> which simply means you can live in a million dollar house, but if you are retired, you can collect main care. Jeez. I lost my job this year. Okay. That's the last time I was in my insurance. Doesn't mean I have good insurance, I don't. At the end of it all, when I go to the hospital or whatever, I have thousands of dollars. Of I'm going to have to pay. If it's ten bucks a time, whatever. And then you have people who are on main care, and they're younger, they're having sure three and four kids, and different fathers, and they go in and have main care paid off. Hey, I, I'm, I'm married. These kids are married. Oh, I want another kid. Main care's going to pay that. I or, or I, uh, my in-going pony, I run to emergency. I don't have that luxury. I have to make sure I'm on deathbed to get in there. You're speaking to the it. choir, and that's exactly what I mean about the childless adults and the 19, 20 year olds. We need to protect the most vulnerable, which is the mentally ill, the handicapped, and our elders. And those are the ones of my priority. become an entitlement state and we need to get people that can work to get out and work. I agree with you. Okay, we just reversed, we had a program that was given $10 million of federal money a year and uh, we had four whips around the state. We found out that out of the $10 million, once you tracked it down, only, seven, uh, only about 2.2 uh, .2 million found its way into training. So we're redesigning it so all the money is gonna go into training. We're working with the community college, the CTEs, to get short-term uh, training. So that when there are jobs are available, for instance, when a uh, job, yeah. Down like a rundle machine, these six machinists. We're sending people over to the community college to get a month's worth of training before they start their jobs. That's one of the programs that we can do. Unfortunately, a lot of people, like for instance, the blueberry harvest, they had to go offshore to get people to come in and, and rake the blueberries because people didn't want to do it. They had to go to Jamaica and Mexico to bring in foreign labor. Not because, not because they, they didn't want to use workers. I know of a, an apple farmer who's, who's a representative hired 60, 60 people to start on a Monday and by Friday he had three left. <laughs> 